So, in the last lecture we took a look at uh, the need for formal specifications and formal methods in the software engineering processes. And uh, in this lecture we are going to go a little deeper into the two modes of uh, formal specifications, the algebraic form of formal specifications as well as the model based specifications. Recall that uh, we started out with trying to specify requirements using natural language and there were certain disadvantages that came out of this which were, uh, which were quite significant and uh, we summarized those disadvantages in this slide. Uh, the first one was clearly the ambiguity, right? The same statement written in a natural language could be interpreted in multiple ways by multiple developers or multiple analysts. As a result of which, um, the what came out of the whole process was not necessarily what was intended by the client doing the specification. The uh, the second thing, the problem was the multiple levels of specificity within a single specification. That is, there could be something at a very high level of abstraction, uh, such as the um, editor uh, that we talked about, the grid editor example that we talked about. At the same time, there could be something with a very, very detailed, uh, a level of detail that was not commensurate with the, the earlier parts of the specification. The last disadvantage clearly was one of verbosity, where uh, using natural languages to, to specify what the software was meant to do was going to result in significantly larger documents than using formal methods. Um, so, we saw uh, that there were several types of formal methods, uh, the two main types being the ones that were based on the state of the uh, state of the objects that were being described. We look, took a look at the library example the last time um, and we uh, and the, these were called state based specifications, a family of languages belonging to this was Z, VDM and so on. And there are also the algebraic specifications or those that are based on the operations or the operational definitions. And that is what we are going to take a look at today is uh, get into a little bit of detail as to how to specify software modules using either algebraic specifications or state based specifications. Uh, one of the things that we have to keep in mind is that specifications lead us to a higher level of abstraction. Uh, than using either natural language or tying ourselves down to a particular implementation or representation early in the cycle. So, that is the other advantage that it, uh, it tends to give us is that it, it saves us from the, the danger of using physical representations in analysis. Uh, a good example of our specification is the Y2K problem. Um, and there what happened was that instead of representing a date as a date as an abstract entity, um, what, what happened was there was the commitment for the date being uh, having a year field which was uh, specifically represented uh, two digits. And that representation of date using two digits was used all over the program code. So, so as a result of which when, when the date had to change to four digits, the obvious problem followed that there were hundreds to thousands of places in any given program or application that had to be modified because they all assumed the internal structure of what the date contained. And this was a problem of what is called over specification. Um, so, you are not confining yourself to the interfaces of the entity that you are talking about the date in this particular case which, which, which should just have been uh, represented as something that contained a year field and how the year field was implemented whether it was done using two digits, four digits or whatever should have been completely left out of the specification, but it was not. And that uh, the, the, the tying into the, the, the logical to the physical representation was, was a problem of over specification. Um, another problem is that uh, there could be many different implementations that are possible and uh, each implementation can be tied into the logical representation at a point in time in the design cycle when it makes sense to make the decision, right. So, for example, if you consider a stack data structure, which is a pretty commonly used data structure in uh, most applications, the stack data structure can be implemented either using uh, a list, for example, it can be implemented using an array and so on and so forth. But the decision as to how the what the representation of the stack is going to be, the physical representation is going to be and uh, when this gets bound to the logical definition of the stack should be done as late as possible in the software development life cycle. And again this, this is to some extent it does not belong in the specification, but if, if we assume the internal representation very early on in the cycle it could uh, lead to several problems. And also the, the notion of reuse has to be taken into account here 
an abstract definition of a data structure such as a stack or a date or a, uh, the insulin pump example that we saw has to be uh, is something that can be reused over several different projects for example or even in the same projects across different modules. But if it is tied to the physical representation that may not be suitable from one module to the next then the, the reuse is no longer going to be possible and it is going to get cut off. As a result of which we need to be moving towards a higher level of abstraction and that is what the notion of uh, abstract specifications allow us to do. Uh, they allow us to view an object, an entity, a module within the specification by its operations and not by the implementation or the representation that it is going to get tied to at some later point of time in the life cycle of the, uh, life cycle of the software. So this is uh, also well illustrated by what is called the principle of selfishness. Um, and uh, the way it is stated here is that an orange, a fruit orange can be viewed in many different forms. It can be viewed as a color orange, it can be viewed as a fruit that uh, is going to give some juice to a person who is thirsty. It can be viewed, uh, if you are a painter it is viewed by the color, uh, you know it, if you are a farmer it is something that you can sell in the market and you can make a profit out of um, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, so it, it depending on the perspective then a particular logical representation of this can be laid out and uh, you, you only want to stick to that particular perspective and therefore you are moving towards a higher level of abstraction as you go down this path and that is what we are interested in doing. So uh, before we get into the details of what uh, algebraic specifications consist of, it is useful to take a look at what exactly does a mathematical model of software represent and uh, we shall uh, look at that first. So the, the mathematical modeling of software essentially involves translating an input space which is represented here by i which is given to a function and this is the one f that is doing the translation and this function is translating the input space to some kind of output space. Right. So a program is in a sense a mathematical object and we can write f of i equals o and the language that is being used here is nothing but a mathematical notation and therefore we can prove certain properties about it. So it, it for example does the software do what it is supposed to do. Uh, the second thing is uh, is it doing something that it is not supposed to do? Both of these things are something that are things that have to be proved about the software and a mathematical model will, will help us uh, create this proof, right. Um, with that we can take a look at uh, different types of mathematical models, one of which is an algebraic specification that we are going to be looking at shortly. But before that uh, we can look at something much simpler which are called IO assertions. Uh, it is a part of algebraic specifications as well but IO assertions are much simpler and IO assertions simply take the form S P Q and what this is trying to uh, what this is trying to say is that if S holds before the program P is executed then Q is going to hold after the program P is executed right. So an example of an IO assertion which is a way of formally modeling software um, it can be that we have a sum equals 0 that is the, uh, the preconditional assertion if you will and the function that is going to take place of the software program that is going to run says for i equals 0 to n sum equals sum plus a i. So this is the definition of the program that is going to run and after the program is executed a certain condition is going to hold true and that condition in this case is going to be sum equals sigma j equals 1 to n a j. So essentially what we are trying to say is it is a software specification which says the precondition is that there is a variable whose a uh, value is null or equal to 0 and there is a program that is going to execute and the guarantee that is given by the specification SPQ is that after this particular program executes which is you are running a, uh, a loop 
over a, a series of numbers which are being added to the sum, then the sum is going to contain the sum total of all the numbers within that particular array. Right, that that is kind of the uh, uh, assertion that you are making, it is called an IO assertion, it is also another form of uh, software specification that is used fairly commonly. Next we will start taking a look at what abstract data types are made of and uh, what exactly are abstract data types, how do they fit into algebraic specifications. Remember we said that algebraic specifications focus on the operational um, interfaces right or the, or, the, or the notations that are used to lay out the different operations that can be supported by a data type or can be supported by an entity right. So, for example, a print server is an entity that can support a bunch of operations and we saw that the interface specification of the print server would go something like it would, uh, it would accept a particular printer. Uh, to manage then it would allow you to queue documents to the printer, it would allow you to dequeue documents from the print server queue, it would allow, to allow you to monitor the status of the queue at any given point in time um, and so on. Right. So, um, an algebraic specification essentially allows the specification to be decomposed into a set of different objects and every object is represented by a abstract data type. Right. Um, so, there can be for example, a stack object, it can be a list object, it can be a date object, it can be a Unix directory object, um, it can be a print server object and so on and so forth and every object is represented uh, in the abstract by a uh, what is called an ADT or an abstract data type and we will see what the different elements of the ADT are. So, so the first uh, element of the ADT as is shown on the slide are the collection of objects that are characterized by features and axioms or the type of the object right. So, for example, if it is a print server then you will say that the type here is a print server. If it were a stack that you were trying to describe then you would say that the type of this thing were a stack and so on and so forth. If it were a list then it would be a list. So, so the first thing that the abstract data type consists of is just the definition of the type that you are trying to lay out. And this can be a parameterized type or it can be a raw type just by itself, right. A raw type is something like a date for example, it is not parameterized by anything and it is just a date. However, a list could be a, list, a generic list, it could be a list of some specific type of objects only say a list of integers or a list of uh, rational numbers. In that case, it would be parameterized by a list of some type t and that type t would be filled in at a later point in time. Right. So, it is a set of types that you operate on. The second thing that is important about an abstract data type is the set of operations of the functions that the data type is going to support. Remember the important thing about algebraic specifications is that it does not, it is not based on the state. So, you do not expose the state of the object or the state of the type in the case of algebraic specifications, but it is purely based on the interfaces or the signatures of the functions themselves. Uh, based together with the constraints on what these functions are allowed to do on objects of that type, right. So, the, the operations of the functions are essentially the operations that are applicable to every single instance of the type. And one of the examples here can be that if you take the stack abstract data type, you can push an element onto the stack, right. If you took a look at the date data type, you can create a new instance of the date, you can read the correct inst current instance of the date. You can change the month, you can change the year um, and so on and so forth. There each one of these essentially represents an operation and the operation is characterized by a certain signature which says what are the different, what is the name of the operation, what are the different input parameters that this operation expects or takes and what are the types of those input parameters and then what is the output that is returned by the operation, right. Uh, there are different types of operations or functions that can exist within the description of an ADT. Um, the creators are those that create new instances of the ADT. So, a new stack for example, will return a new instance of the stack, a new date will return a new instance of the date and so on. Uh, then there can be what are called commands. Commands are those operations that change the state of the type, change the state of an instance of the type. Um, so, for example, setting the date or setting the month in a date ADT would uh, be a command function or a command operation. And lastly, we have query operations that are used to extract the state of whatever the data type already contains at any given point in time. Even though the, st remember, even though the state itself is not explicitly being described here, 
the operations that are possible to manipulate the state in any which way either change the state or read what the state is are given out and the types of the input parameters and the types of the output parameters are also described as part of the operational signature right. There can also be partial functions and these are typically described using constraints or preconditions that we will take a look at um, later. The third important thing that an ADT contains are a set of rules, it is essentially a set of um, uh, rules that say that instances of the ADT have to behave in accordance with these set of rules, right. Uh, a good example for the set of rules would be that if you took an empty stack or if you took a new stack that has just been constructed and you pushed an element x onto the stack and if you pop the stack you should get the element x, right. That is a simple rule that describes the properties about pushing, uh, uh, pushing an element. Right. Only those properties that, that really matter need to be described. It is easy to get carried away when you are describing axioms here and there are, there, there, there are certain laws that govern how many axioms are just right when you are describing an abstract data type um, representation. And uh, so we, we need to be careful to stick only to those axioms of properties that really end up mattering. Right. And lastly, uh, remember we talked about partial functions, functions can be partial in nature and partial functions essentially means that the function cannot be executed under all conditions. The, the results of the execution of the function under certain conditions is undefined that uh, you will not get any result out of it and preconditions are the way that help us define which functions are partial functions. So uh, you popping an empty stack for example makes no sense at all. Right. So, this here is the example of a partial functions pop which basically will work only under those conditions that the stack is not empty right and that is a example of a precondition. So, a pop of a stack would require that not empty of the stack be true would be a precondition in this particular case. So, what we are trying to do here is create intuitive definitions of the stack operations as we go along or the operations of an ADT as we go along right and uh, what, what would probably be helpful would be to actually take a look at the entire stack and see how this thing pans out. Um, one of the things that we may ask ourselves when we are trying to do this is uh, we, we saw that in the IO assertion uh, type of specification that we saw just a little while ago we had something like a S, P followed by Q and there the notation was that you had S, you ran the program P and Q was really the resulting state of the world. So the question we may ask ourselves is how about the applicability of a post condition to the abstract data type as well. Now class invariants and post conditions really apply mainly to the operational and not to the uh, operational or the imperative style of programming or style of expression, right. So, uh, those things are not generally expressed in algebraic specifications because the implication here really is that instead of manipulating an existing structure or an existing instance of the type, you are always handing back a new instance. So, the state of the existing type never ever gets changed in this case and we will take a look, look at an example of what that means shortly in the case of a stack and how we write out the specification of the stack. In fact, uh, maybe it is a it is a good time to go into that right now. What we are going to try and do here is to write down the complete ADT for a stack. And see what the different parts of the ADT look like when, when it is a stack, right. So the first part remember was the denotation of the type. The type that we are trying to write down here is that of the stack. Right. It can be parameterized by the type G in this case. What we are trying to say is that the stack only takes elements, contains elements of the type G, right. So that is the only type uh, information that would be needed in this particular case. The next thing that we would have to move on to are the different operations that are going to be possible on the stack, right. The the first operation would be that of being able to create a stack, let us call it new or new stack which would make it clearer. And the new stack is an operation that takes no input parameters and in fact returns a stack, right. 
So, this notation essentially means that it is something that uh, the, this notation means that this is the name of the operation what is being written out of the first part is the name of the operation followed by a set of input parameters that the operation may or may not take and that returns what is the type of the return value that is expected. In this case it returns a stack of type G right. The next operation similarly we can write out a bunch of different operations the intuitively the next one that comes to mind is push and in the case of push it takes as its input parameters two different arguments one is an existing stack and one is an element that gets to be pushed onto the stack right. Taking these two it essentially returns another stack g to you. Now what this is trying to say remember th this is what we meant by it is the non imperative or the declarative style of programming in ADTs or this kind of spe algebraic specifications. Now uh, what this essentially means is that we are not manipulating the same stack but instead you are returning a new stack which has the element pushed onto it that, that is the implication in the, the signature of the push operation that we have just written out. Similarly we can write out a pop operation for the stack which basically takes a stack as an input argument and what is the pop operation expected to return typically it returns back the stack but with the top element of it removed. So it does not really return the top element of the stack and we have to be careful of that which is why we end up writing an L, we, we, we end up writing a query operation remember the types of operations that can exist one of them is a creator operation which is a new stack operation the push operation and the pop operation are essentially operations that are command operations and top is an example of a query operation and top will take a stack and it is expected to return the topmost element of the stack which is um, of type G all right and the last operation that we can think of that would be useful in the case of a stack is an is empty operation right which will take a stack and this is a query against a stack which will simply return a boolean that says whether the stack is empty or not right. So these these five operations are intuitively those that that can be written out for a stack data type right. Uh, now remember the ADT is not yet complete and we need to still write out for the stack ADT we need to write out two more things those are preconditions and axioms. So let us just start by writing out the preconditions in the case of a stack and we, we saw one of them a little earlier during our discussion uh, in the case of preconditions. So if, if you want to look for uh, you cannot pop an empty stack is one of the preconditions right. So the pop operation has a precondition which is is empty returns false. Right. Um, so, so this this is one of the preconditions that would exist in the case of a stack is that you cannot pop an empty stack. Similarly, if we actually has a size, if if we had a size element that was associated with the stack, then we can also say that you cannot push onto a stack that is already full. But in this particular case, we have really not taken uh, we, we we have really not taken uh, the, the fact that. Uh, we have not taken account of the fact that the stack actually has some kind of a pre-built size associated with it. Uh, so we are assuming an infinitely large stack as a result of which the only precondition for this stack is that is empty returns false. Now the more interesting aspect of an ADT are really the rules that we talked about or the axioms remember we said that these are rules that write out constraints on the behavior of the stack 
even though we are not actually tying it down to any particular representation, we are still trying to put down certain rules that say that no matter what representation you end up using, suppose the stack is implemented as a list, the stack is implemented as an array, whatever, then you still got to make sure that these rules are valid and that, that is what is important about it. Uh, so, some of the rules that we can start writing down immediately are is empty of a new stack has to return is empty of a new stack always have to return true because as soon as a new stack is constructed and nothing has been pushed onto it is empty is always got to be true. So, that is one of the uh, uh, axioms and given the precondition if you do end up popping a new stack right. So, if we apply the pop operation to a new stack remember we said that the precondition is that is empty is false but in the new stack case is empty is always going to be true as a result of which the pop operation always has to result in an error in this case right. So, here are two axioms. The third axiom is that the same thing can apply to top as well. The top of a new stack is going to also result in an error right and finally we can we, we can write out uh, one rule that basically says that when you create a new stack when you create a new stack and then you push an element g onto the new stack and you take the top of that stack it always necessarily has to return g right what this rule is trying to say is that when you when you push an element onto a stack that is empty then there is only going to be one element on the stack and nothing else can exist and that is defining a property of the push operation per se and what uh, and a way of testing the fact that uh, the push will only push the element once onto the stack and that element is always going to be at the topmost element of the stack is to quickly do a top operation on the push of a new stack which is guaranteed to always return the single element that you just pushed onto the stack right. So, this example is trying to illustrate uh, it is trying to illustrate a very simple uh, higher level of abstraction that we are trying to create out of a stack data type. Now, this can be applied to pretty much any module that you end up coming up uh, with in your specification. It could be a date specification that you are trying to write down. So, what you are trying to do here is put some constraints on the behavior of what this data type is going to be capable of doing when it is implemented down by the designers and the developers of the system right and so this has to be done up front as much as possible. Now, what these axioms essentially help us at the end of the day is that we can do certain algebraic manipulations using these axioms right. And uh, no matter how long an algebraic manipulation you are given, the rules will always guarantee that you end up with a valid value, right? That is what the, the the rules of the axioms are meant to do. And an example that is shown on this slide, it's a fairly long example. You're taking a stack, you're doing several operations on this. So you're creating a new stack. First thing you're doing is pushing the value x4 onto it. Uh, then you're pushing the value x5 onto it, you are popping it and so on and so forth. It is a huge combination of operations that are being performed on this and if we work this entire expression out, it is nothing but an expression in the mathematical model that we have created right and we can work this out just like in algebraic manipulations you can reduce certain expressions down to simpler expressions that is what we can do in this case as well. Given the rules that we have we can reduce this particular expression down to a single value that eventually comes out of it which happens to be x4 in this particular case. And what is important is that this single value x4 for this particular expression is going to have to be true 
no matter how the stack is going to get implemented down the line and that is what the power of the axioms uh, give us at the end of the day. Um, so, it, it essentially gives us the quality that is unchanging about a stack no matter how it is going to get implemented. So, one of the things that we may ask ourselves is that what about concrete realizations of this? So far we have taken a look at describing a very abstract representation of what a stack data type is, but how are we going to convert this to a programmatic entity that can actually be used in an application. Right? And uh, typically there is a very, very clean mapping between abstract data types and uh, object oriented data structures. Uh, this is something that you will probably see during the later part of the course when we described object oriented design, but object oriented data structures uh, allow us to essentially map these abstract data types very cleanly onto them and, uh, and these are called classes and you must have uh, read about this in uh, a class on object oriented programming and classes can either be deferred classes or they are the deferred in the sense they are partially implemented or they can be effective classes or fully implemented classes right. And depending on how much of concreteness you want to uh, give yourself at a particular point in time then uh, you know we can go for a deferred class or uh, an abstract class. So, the axioms that we saw on the stack essentially can be very simply. Um, stated in English as well, right. I mean it could have been stated in a natural language, but we chose to uh, write it down in an algebraic specification. Uh, for example, one of the axioms was that a new stack is always empty and we wrote it down in a formal manner saying is empty of new stack is equals true, uh, but that is nothing but uh, a natural language specification what that would simply be that a new stack is always empty. And when you push an element onto a new stack, then the top of the stack always has to contain that single element that you have just pushed onto the stack, right. So, these things uh, what you can see is that the mathematical models that we have created using algebraic specifications in this case are a very powerful concise notation. Remember the, the, the characteristics of formal specifications that we talked about last time. One of them was it had to be complete, the second thing was it had to be concise. Uh, the third thing was it had to be correct and th there were no uh, ambiguities about it and so on, right. And those properties as you can see are pretty well satisfied by the algebraic specification for a stack that we just wrote out. Um, so, we can add certain operators to this, we can, we can add new operations to this whole thing and what we essentially end up coming up with is a, a, a more detailed representation of one of these data structures. So, what it takes to get from an ADT or an abstract data type to an effective class is really the specification itself and this is the unchanging part of it. This can be handed down to a developer for example and ask him to implement it and the developer has to make sure that when he implements it all the rules that are given in the axioms have to be true. You need some kind of a concrete representation at the end of the day when it gets turned into an executable piece of code then there needs to be a concrete representation and the, in the case of the stack it can be implemented using arrays, it can be implemented using lists and so on. And what you need now is also a mapping that goes from the abstract data type down to the representation, representational capabilities that exist. So, for an array you can do certain set of manipulations, you have to make sure that for every operation that exists within the abstract data type you can map it down to the set of concrete, so to the set of operations that are possible in the concrete representation that you have chosen. Right. And one of the important things that you have to keep in mind is that this mapping essentially has to obey the axioms and they have to check for the preconditions that we have laid out in the notation itself. The one um, important thing that we will discuss pretty soon is the notion of abstract data types and information hiding. Right. Um, as you will as you'll recall information hiding is a very important characteristic of building of software modularization. And uh, what it essentially strives to say is only that part of the, uh, the data type of the software module that needs to be, uh, that is needed for interaction with other modules is the one that needs to be exposed and details of the internal representation must not be exposed. And ADT is give us a perfect way of doing that because the ADT part of a data type is the one that will end up getting exposed right? and that is the public part if you will 
of the module software module that is being specified and the, the secret of the private part that is behind the scenes is really the implementation of it. So, the choice of the representation that is chosen and implementation of the functions by the different features is something that can be deferred to a later point in time because it is not going to be exposed. Indeed, it can even be changed at any point in time in the program as long as you stick to the specification that is the power of it. So, now let us one of the questions that we have to ask ourselves after having just written out the specification for a stack is that for example, is the specification complete right. How, how can we end up answering the question what is the reference point for completeness right for a stack how do we know that no other operations are, for example, are going to be required right. And so, there are the notion of what are called atomic operations and non, uh, non atomic operations and we have to consider a, a, a implementation to be complete if essentially you have described all the atomic operations. In the case of the stack we could easily have written another operation called the replace operation. The replace operation would essentially take a stack, it would take an item and it would replace the top item of the stack with a the new item that you are giving it. So, mathematically what this would look like is <coughs> it would be called replace item let us say and this would take two arguments. The, the two arguments that it would end up taking are a given stack and it would take some element g 1 right and this would end up returning a new stack. But the effect of this essentially is to say that if is empty if is empty equals false only if there is an item to be replaced in the stack in that case what i'm going to do is i can i'm first going to pop the stack that has been given to me because i have to remove the topmost element of the stack so i'm going to pop the stack that has been given to me and I am going to take the result of the pop and then I am going to push the element g 1 onto the resulting stack right. This is the definition of the operation of replace item. However, what we see is that the operation replace item is one that is almost entirely in fact, it is entirely composed of operations that have already been defined is empty already exists within the stack definition that we gave, push exists within the stock stack definition that we gave and pop also exists within the stack definition that we gave. So, operations such as pop and push and is empty can be considered to be what are called atomic operations in that they cannot be broken down further and expressed in terms of other operations of the stack. Whereas, operations such as replace items and there can be any number of these operations that we can come up with are what are called non atomic or compound operations. So, this would be compound in nature whereas, these three would be atomic in nature. So, coming back to the notion of completeness of a specification what we really have to think about is mathematically uh, if the axioms that have been laid out right uh, can be used to prove any expression that can be constructed out of the language of the theory then it is a complete specification that is the definition of mathematical completeness. And what this really means to say is that given all the axioms and the operations if I can combine these pushes and the pops and the is empties and the news and the tops in any particular order as long as it is it has to satisfy two criteria first is syntactically it has to be a well formed operation right and semantically secondly it has to be correct. So, what do we mean by this? What we mean is syntactically there are certain rules that we have laid out when we define the operations themselves right. So, for example, push always took two arguments which is a stack of type g and an element of type g right. So, a push of just an element of type g is not a valid operation is not a well formed expression in other words right. Uh, so, uh, first we have to make sure that syntactic correctness exists and as long as syntactic correctness exists and it is a completely well formed expression then 
you have to look at whether the expressions are meaningful. So, for example, do they satisfy the preconditions, right? Some of the operations resulted in an error, for example. So, if there were no errors and if it were syntactically meaningful expression that was uh, that was being laid out, then the axioms could be used to prove that expression. And that is what we mean by uh, the, the specification is essentially complete. So, what we are trying to look at is both structural integrity or syntactic correctness as well as semantic integrity that needs to be checked for. And uh, query expressions are obviously very, very important in this whole operation, right. So, there is a definition of uh, sufficient completeness uh, that is fairly formal that we are looking at at this slide is the ADT specification for any given type, right, is sufficiently complete if and only if the axioms that have been laid out for that particular ADT, right, make it possible to solve the following problems in any well formed expression of E. First determine whether E is correct, right, given some expression E and we saw an expression that was the, the long sequences of pushes and pops on an empty stack which evaluated to this value x4, right. If we can prove that that indeed is the case by using reduction, having used the different axioms that are present, right, and we can prove that value is equal to x4, then it is a valid expression and it e is correct, right. That is what we mean by to prove that e is correct. And the second condition that we are holding true in this case is if E has is a query expression, remember the different types of expressions that can exist are command operations or command expressions, query expressions and so on and constructor expressions. Uh, if it is a query expression and has shown to be correct under the S1 rule that we just laid out, then we should be able to express the value of the expression in a value that does in a way that does not involve the type T itself that is being tested for completeness. Now, although this seems a little complex. What this, what this is really going to show is the fact that if given any expression that can be formulated out of the language, right. So, the, the language that is being given to us is a set of operations that are possible on the stack, right. And uh, so, replace item for example, that we just wrote out a few minutes ago is a new expression that we wrote out using the operations that were given to us earlier. Right. We have to determine whether this expression is correct or wrong, that is it is syntactically correct, it is structurally, you know, there is structural integrity within this, um, that there are no error conditions that can exist on this operate, this expression. And if so, uh, it is, a, if it is a query expression particularly, then it will, it can be evaluated into a form that does not involve any more operations within the definition itself. So, that is the uh, definition of sufficient completeness. And in the case, there is one other property that we have to look for when we are writing out abstract data types, right. And the other property is that of consistency. Uh, remember, we said that formal specifications have certain properties attached to them, there, there was one of completeness and one of consistency. And so, in this case, the consistency rule that can be applied is that any expression that can be formed and is evaluated, there is no two values that can result from that particular expression. So, the, the axioms that have been written out for a particular abstract data type can, will, will make it possible to infer at most a single value for the expression uh, in the sense that there is no ambiguity that can result from this as a result of which there is a consistent set of specifications. So, that is the uh, rule here. We will take a look at a couple of other examples, so that the, the concepts become a little clearer in this case. And one of the first examples we will look at is that of a Unix directory, right, fairly common and this can be applied even to a Windows directory, except that we are using some syntax that is, that is specific to Unix directories, right. So, in the case of the type it is the that of the Unix directory. So, we are not going to go uh, and we will call the Unix directory in a short form notation, we will call it uder, right. Now, what are the different operations that can be performed in the case of a Unix directory? This is what we have to ask ourselves, right. Um, we should be able to go to the root of the entire file system. So, we will we'll call a slash operation which will essentially give you back what the root is, right. The second operation would be that you are able to form a new directory and this is commonly called MKDIR 
in several unique shells. So, this takes two things a U directory that is the present working directory that you are already in and the name of the directory. So, the, the cross essentially means that it is a Cartesian product here. The name of the directory which is simply a string and gives you back another Unix directory right. Now, cd which is the change directory command which is also used quite frequently takes where you are which is the Unix directory that you are in at this point in time and it takes a id to go to right. It can be an entire path that you are giving it and then it returns id or a name is actually being used interchangeably. So, I am just going to write that down here so that there is no confusion they are both strings a path is nothing but a string as well equals string. So, you the, the cd operation takes a unix directory and the directory to which you want to go to and it lands you in that particular directory itself right. Now, what are the other operations that can be formed in the unix directory? One of them is pwd or present working directory which basically takes a directory as an argument and returns you back the id or the name of the directory in the form of a string right all the way from the root it is going to give you the path to the current working directory that you are at. Now, you can these are the, the basic operations um, one of the uh, one more basic operation that you can think of that might be useful is to determine whether a given directory exists on this file system. So, you can say that here is an id search the entire file system for me and return me a boolean to say whether this is indeed a directory that exists within this file system. So, we have written out a few operations that we believe are atomic operations in this particular case and um, what we have to look at next is the notion of writing out the different uh, we have to look at the notion of uh, writing out the different axioms because that is what is important to us. Right. So, what are the axioms that can be applied to the different operations that we have? So, right. we had uh, a couple of uh, PWD operations, we can think of axioms relating to PWD. So, PWD of slash right will always be the string slash. So, for example, if this is a root directory that you are in and then you ask for the present working directory in the root directory, it always has to give you back the string slash. Right now, PWD of a make dir command and make dir command takes two arguments, which is some directory and some ID. Right. So the pre, uh, uh, this is assuming that equals PWD of D itself. Why? What? What is this axiom trying to say? This axiom is trying to point out that the present working directory operation that is applied to a make directory operation of D and I right that means you are in D and you are making a new directory whose id is I then it is the same as applying the PWD operation to D because you are not going to end up changing the directory in that particular instance right. So, that is nothing but D. Similarly, we can apply the PWD operation to the change directory structure as well and then change directory also takes two arguments remember it takes d and i as the two arguments you are changing from the directory d into the directory i and here we can say that the the result of this change directory operation and PWD is nothing but uh, the uh, the PWD of I because you are changing into the directory I right. So, that is the result of this particular operation. Similarly, we can write out a set of other axioms that will essentially uh, give us some correctness criteria on the uh, Unix directory structure that we just wrote out on the last slide just uh, for reference I am just reproducing this one 
and it looks like uh, we, we had all the operations. One of the other operations that we can choose to define for example is the notion of an up operation right so you can, it's like instead of saying cd dot dot which is what you normally end up trying to do in the case of a unix directory you can define an up operation which basically takes you up one level in the directory hierarchy right um, <clears throat> and no matter how many times you go up from the root you always have to be in the root would be an axiom that you would also end up considering uh, writing down in this case um, one more example that we would like to take a look at before we uh, close this uh, session on algebraic data types would be the case of a list. Again a commonly used data structure and uh, let us first write out the operations. The type is fairly obvious. The type is list of G. This is a parameterized type. As you can see the Unix directory was a not, not a parameterized uh, type. In this case it is a parameterized type. The different operations or the functions that can be used to manipulate instances of the of, of type G, uh, type list of G is first thing you should be able to create a list or a make new list kind of operation and this takes no arguments and gives you back an item of type list of G right. Now here we have the notion of an insert on a list right. The insert takes a few arguments, it takes a list, it takes an index at which to, so, there, there, so the notion of an insert being different from the notion of an append, it takes a particular index as to where this thing is being inserted and it takes the item right g itself the item to be inserted within the list and it returns another list of type g right. Similarly we can have a delete and delete will take a list as an argument and an index as to which item do you want to delete and this returns a new list. Right. Uh, now you can also have a uh, retrieve operation and the retrieve operation taking a list and an index and it returns an element of type G. Similarly you can have an is empty check just like we had on the case of a stack and is empty takes a list and it simply returns a boolean to show whether this list has any elements within it or not right. Now the one thing that is left for us is to write out the axioms for the list and the axioms for the list there are many many axioms that you can end up writing for this right you can write uh, based on the uh, one of the operations that we missed out in the case of a list is to have an operation that will return the length of the list right. So the length of the list will take a list as an argument and it returns an integer which denotes the length of the list right. That was one operation that we missed out so I am just writing it on top of the slide in this case. So some of the axioms that we can write out are things like when we create a new list is empty of a create is indeed true. Similarly we can say is empty of uh, a create followed by an insert, insert create comma g1 is false. What this is trying to say is that if I have an empty list, uh, I have just created it, I am I'm, I'm I'm checking the query operator is empty on the newly created list, it has to return true whereas the is empty operator on a list that has been just created but an element has been inserted into it is false and, uh, and so on. So these are the kinds of axioms that we would end up writing even for the list just like we had written for a stack 
and there are several axioms we can write. We have to create combinations of the operators in order to write down the axioms and there are certain rules for that uh, as well that we, we will not go into because of the complexity of some of the rules. But the definition for completeness that we had followed earlier and as well as consistency are two things that we have to be able to prove at, uh, uh, at, at the end of the day having written out uh, an abstract data type specification. Um, so, what we have looked at and what we have seen in this class is some ways of actually translating uh, the notion of a formal uh, writing down a formal specification in the first place. What does it look like? What are the different structural elements of a formal specification? And we have written that using algebraic uh, data types essentially. We, we have not gone into state based models Z, VDM and so forth, but these are some things for which references will be available as part of this course. Um, and you can uh, choose to look them up. Uh, so, what we have done is we have uh, we have seen how to write out algebraic specifications, um, how these can be formal in the sense of creating mathematical models which we can use to prove uh, the correctness about the language that we have just ended up creating. And hopefully these methods will be useful in uh, further specification efforts that you may be involved.